Welcome to the Higher Encounters Christian Ministries webcast. In the human heart lives misconceptions, and because of this, our understanding of God and of mankind is flawed. But through encounters with Him, we receive revelation. God opens our eyes to who He is and to who we are. After that, nothing is the same.
is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hill. Walking up the 
I want to be like Moses. For one thing, he lived an old, old age. <laughs> and the Bible says his eye was not diminished. He, he lived to an old age with the blessings of God and the respect of his people upon him. And one thing that I like about Moses, he's seen God. And when he's, because he's seen God, he was able to trust Over, right? 
Don't they always like to throw one last twist into the plot? Somebody, something that you think is dead and gone, it generally it just pops right back up. That's, that's their way. They like to make it out. Everything's smooth sailing now, you know. The bad guy's whipped. Evil's conquered. And about that time it raises this, you know, the music's going to change. Sometimes I've been known to reach over and touch my wife. I says, be ready. Because <laughs> my wife is a shouter. <laughs> She, she jumps of everything. I don't know what she would do if I was to drop something actually valuable. But if I knocked over the music stand this morning. It's just like she's electric shocked. Moses, they had left Egypt. I just can hear, but this is over. Then they come to the bank of the Red Sea. You ever hear the saying caught between the devil and the deep blue sea? That's where it come from. A rock in a hard place. Job called it. And the sea before, no way forward, looking back, Pharaoh's armies behind. But God speaking to Moses, be still, see the salvation of God. He sticks forth his rod and the sea parts. Wouldn't it be just great to have that kind of faith? When things really get dark that you just say, hey, <laughs> just wait a minute, wait a minute, look what God's getting ready to do. Just, just wait just a second. Don't panic. It's going to be all right. I'm, is that a ferret? That's what I thought it was. One thing I loved about puppies, puppies don't come into this world like kittens. Kittens tend to be pretty coordinated pretty quick, generally. Puppies, they get big, <laughs> but they're very awkward. I had a bunch one time, a bunch, and we had a little set of steps that went to the back, just three steps, it wasn't too high. And then puppies would get up on there. They was good at getting up. They was not good at turning around. Because every time they try to get up and turn around, they'd fall. <laughs> and uh, most of us, I don't know if you've ever, uh, because I work construction, there's been a few times in my life I've heard somebody holler for me. That they got that certain pitch to their voice that you know that something's went wrong. Uh, step ladders. I've seen people fall off of roofs, just different things. And it doesn't take a, a brainiac to know that when someone's holding on by their fingertips, that you don't have to say, what is it that you need? <laughs> I turn around and see my buddy and his stepladder about this far out, and he clinging to the edge of the roof. I didn't have to ask him what it is that you want, friend, and I'll see if we've got it in stock. I knew what he wanted. He wanted some support. He wanted it right now. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what is, how important encouragement is. We know that we get so little of it in this world. And we hunger for it. I don't know anyone that doesn't hunger for it. It reminds me of the story of the little boy who wanted to play darts with his dad. I think it might have been lawn darts, but I'm not sure. But I like this part of the story. He said, let's play darts, Dad. He said, when I throw it, you stand there and say, wonderful. Ella, just throwing a ball. Yay for the baby. Sometimes she'll just drop whatever she's doing. She'll clap her hands too. She knows. She knows. Something about encouragement. And folks, we are hungry for it. Not only are we hungry for it, but... We know that we need it, but sometimes it's, we forget that other people need it. And I, I guess I want us to be a church that is, is sensitive to what other people are going through. I thought about buying you all, bringing the stamp to church in an envelope. Because I bet you know somebody who needs encouragement. I don't literally bet, you know, that's, <laughs> that's a figure of speech, but you know what I mean. 
I think you probably know someone who needs some encouragement. And you don't have to ask them what is it they need. You know. Sometimes it's because you've been through it yourself. And it's just so good. There's a truth in the saying that misery loves company. Sometimes just the fact that you've walked through something. And you've been through it and God brought you through it. You, and you see someone else going through the same thing. Just them saying, you know, look, I understand. I've been here. This is kind of what you can expect, but I want you to know if you just hold on and trust, God's going to bring you through the other side. So when you see someone holding on by their fingertips, this might now, or now, might be a good time to help. Proverbs 15 and 23, a man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is it. It's uh, the Holman Christian Standard uses the word, a timely word. You know what that means. Have you ever had those moments that just someone just said the right thing at the right time? That just made the difference in your day. Some of you probably heard heard me tell you, you've just made my day. And I'm not just kidding that. Sometimes it's just the little things that people do, the little things that people say. The fact that you know it's not always the words that we share, but sometimes it's the hug. It's the moment that we share. I know what you're going through, it says. And I'm says that I, I love you. I, I, can, I feel your pain. It's this ability to help one another, folks, to pass something down that we have. And this is what God has laid upon us, this older generation, for us to do. That's why the Bible says that the older women are supposed to teach the younger women. That's why that I believe in mentoring. The bringing someone alongside of you and sharing your walk. You know, it's okay to go to school for a while. My dad used to say, he said, but eventually you are to graduate. And there ought to come a time in our walk with God that and, uh, early on I can remember that I just soaked up everything that everybody had to say. And I just learned so much so fast because the reason is not that I was smart, it's just I didn't know anything. <laughs> so I just began to learn so much so fast. And, but it came a place in my life that because I had these truths that someone else had planted within me, it was, became time for me to share that with someone else, to change their world for the better to pass down the spirit that God had given me, to share what I have. Peter stood at the gate of the temple with a lame man there. Most people passed him by. A few probably gave him money, which is why he was there. It was the only way without uh, welfare, so to speak, and those sort of things back then. That was the way that they got by. And the Jew was commanded uh, to take care of these kind of people. In other words, be generous. And, but Peter came with something more than that man knew that he had. Because the man, when Peter said, look at me. I ought to come a place in our walk, folks, that we're able to look at someone else and say, look at me. I want to give you something that God has given me. And that's where we are to let them know it comes from. Oftentimes we're a little shy about that, isn't it? God gave me this. God showed me this. God put this in me. And oh, I can share it. Look at me. The man wasn't expecting nothing out of the ordinary except for a little bit of money. Silver and gold have I none. You know, a lot of us, if, the, if something's going on, you know, you pass the raising for for crusade for children, you realize you ain't got your wallet. Silver and gold have I none, (laughs) but such as I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. It's expecting something supernatural. For God to do something supernatural. 
from to be imparted from them into from Peter unto this crippled man. And it, it came to pass. The Bible says he reached down, he took him by the hand, pulled him to his feet. You know, that took a lot of faith in itself, wouldn't you say? It's like pulling someone's wheelchair out from under him. He took him by his hand and pulled him to his feet. And the Bible says strength came to him. And he went from that moment praising God. That's the reaction that you give when you share what you've got from the very presence of God. It's, it's what we have. It's what we can give. Right after Jesus ascended back into heaven, and the day of Pentecost had come. And let me tell you what Pentecost means for the church. Pentecost means there was coming of power from God. Jesus said, this is so important. He says, it's expedient that I go away. He said, if I go not away, he said, the comforter won't come. But he said, if I go away, he said, I will pray the Father and he will send the comforter unto you. And he shall lead you into all truth. And on the day of Pentecost, they was all, the Bible says, all together in one mind and one cord in that upper chamber. And the Bible says they heard the sound of a rushing wind. And tongues of fire set upon them. And they left that experience changed men. Up before then, they probably felt like they were hunted men and wanted to sort of stay out of sight. After all, Jesus had just been crucified weeks earlier. But on that day, Peter stood up and said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. I will feel your, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. They're going to see visions. This is what God has done. Their opposition comes. I want to tell you, when you start to want to let your light shine and speak in the name of Jesus Christ, someone's going to give you the look. Not everyone's going to say, well, God bless you. You got something good going on there. They're going to look for something that you don't have. But I like this they said about uh, Peter and John in Acts the fourth chapter it says, when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and knew that they had been with Jesus. Lord, when's the last time someone was amazed? Because I've been with Jesus. Uneducated and untrained, that doesn't matter. First church was started, folks, by people who had never been to the seminar. They'd just been with Jesus. The first deacons, these people who changed the world in the face of persecution and disbelief, and they founded the church on the, their own blood, suffering for the cause of Christ. And they changed the world, folks, because they had been with Jesus. Oh, God, if we can only be with Jesus, we're going to pass down the spirit that we've received unto them. Elijah and Elisha had this kind of relationship. Elijah, God had moved mightily in his life, worked wonders and miracles. Elisha had traveled around with him. But it wasn't enough for him to observe the things that God was doing through Elijah. If you think that God is with someone that you know here or someone that you see somewhere else, can I tell you that it's not enough just to observe what God is doing through them. But Elisha had a bold request. He said, I want a double portion of your spirit. Now, he didn't mean... A lot of times we think a double portion, we think it twice as much. But he, it is to the extent, in other words, when you and inher people inherited the eldest son in those days, would inherit twice as much as the rest of the kids. Not because that they were favored so much, but the responsibility of caring for the parents as they aged would fall upon the oldest son. That was their job. That was how God had planned for the aged, long time before there was social programs, how God had designed 
for the elderly to be taken care of. And part of the way that they did that, like I said, is when the father would collect through his life and then when he got to a certain stage, he would give this double portion unto his eldest child. Would care for his mother if, after his passing. He would care for the father when he would no longer be able to work. Twice as much. But that didn't mean just, I want all the gravy. That meant I want, all this, I want some of this responsibility laid upon me. I want to do the things you do. I want to be the one that fulfills what you started in this world. And that was his calling, actually. See, Elijah had come very discouraged at one place in his ministry. <laughs> Can I tell you that as you try to do things for Jesus, there's going to be moments of discouragement. And he was running for his life from a woman by the name of Jezebel that we talked a little bit about last week. And, but he had enough sense to go toward the mountain of God. And God at the mountain met him and told him, he says, uh, some folks say, you put it like this, don't whine. <laughs> Elijah said, I'm the only one left. God says, uh, I think it was 7,000. I, I get a little confused on the number. He says, I have yet 7,000 have not yet bowed their knee to Baal. And then God gave him a plan. He says, you go and you, you anoint Elisha to be a prophet in your stead after you go. Every minister, he's looking for an Elisha. Did you know that? If I walk out this door and a tree branch falls on me, I'm mugged by a, a crazy groundhog. And I go to my reward. God had meant for every ministry to have something to come in after it. For the, when the passing of the, the breadwinner would come, there would be the eldest son. The passing of a prophet, there would be another prophet. At the passing of Moses, there was a Joshua. At the, at the ascension of Jesus, there were the apostles. Paul, when his authority would end in the town, when he had to go somewhere else, he would anoint elders. This is God's way. But it needs that someone with the spirit of Elisha to come along and say, give me some of this. Not just the gravy, but lay the weight upon me. Let me help carry it. Let me know what it is. Let it be my responsibility. Anytime we start to do things for God, we hear basically two things, I think. What we lack and what we have. It's sort of like an inventory. Thing is, there's two different voices that list, whisper these things to us. And sometimes we don't know what to discern when it comes to these voices. The chief thing, folks, is discern whether what we're trying to do is the will of God. Once you've just settled that, everything else becomes gravy, okay? Then you know that you know, and you can discern what voice is talking to you. Moses, when he met God at the burning bush, had this to say, I'm not a very good talker, God, and they're not going to believe me anyway. Now, was he looking at this? This is what I don't have. But see, he's forgetting that God had called him to do that. That's, that's when it becomes quite obvious what voice is speaking to us. This voice that tells us that we're not worthy. In the New Testament, Peter put it this way You are a nation of priests and kings. And when I ask you to believe the scripture, I ask you also to believe that one. You are special. I don't mean you're special. I mean you are special. God has brought you into the heavenlies, the Bible says. We are seated in the, the heavenlies with Christ Jesus, who led captivity captive, he said, and gave gifts unto men. So when we seek to do the things of God, 
Sometimes we hear these voices that says, I am nothing and can be nothing. Gideon heard the voice. My, I am the least of the a tribe of people who are the least in Israel. But the voice of God had just said to him, he says, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. And God went on to prophesy how he would destroy the enemy. We as Christians, we should be looking to achieve to the things of God so that we can pass the things that we have achieved and have obtained unto down to the people that come after us. The scriptures, the scripture says in Hebrews, therefore strengthen your tired hands and wicked knees and make straight the path for your feet so that, so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. Get strong. Do some work. So those that are weak coming behind you can handle it. So that they can deal. Those of us like me getting up in age, let us teach those that are after us how to face old age (laughs) with graciousness and peace, knowing that we've placed our life so that we can live a life like uh, Paul lived. He he talked about he had lived his life without uh, paraphrasing it, without any guilt in his heart toward God or man. Now, the only way that you can do that, folks, is to get forgiveness and begin to live differently. Now, Paul could have said, oh, I feel so guilty about what I did. He was there at Stephen's crucifixion, I mean, at stoning. But he didn't. Forgetting those things which are behind, I pressed toward the mark of the high calling of Jesus. Unto Timothy, he said, follow me. He was an encouragement. Sometimes we don't know that we can be an encouragement. There's been a times in my life I was a wee bit of a chicken. I remember one time, big, big cold winter, and I think it was Cherokee Park that has the big hill. Everybody likes to slide down. There were so many people over at That thing was a sheet of ice. It was so cold that the, at the bottom of this big field there was a frozen lake. And if you got it just right, all the way out into the lake. Though I do remember standing up on the top and looking down. The guy got to the lake all right, stood up and fell down. Head meant lake. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't know if I want to do this or not. Long hill. About this time, this little boy comes trucking up without a moment's hesitation. <laughs> God, I got to do it now. And I did. I didn't make the lake. Didn't hurt myself, though. (laughs) I was going this way. It's so slick. I was turning this way hard as I could, and I was going that way. Spun out before I got to the bottom. But it is amazing with someone who has no fear what they can do for those that come around behind them. To me, When everybody's starting to shake around them, when they look up, let them see a calmness on your face that they don't understand. And you said, I can't do that. I'm telling you, you can with Jesus Christ. You are selling so short the things that God is able to put into your heart. One thing that I learned from my dad, my dad's not afraid to try anything. He's tried a few things I didn't think he ought to try. Uh, some things I don't want to mess with because they're too expensive if I break them. <laughs> Dad didn't care. He'd just do it. When it come down, I had a big, uh, that big stump next to my double wide up there. It died and he'd cut down. I'll cut it down. Dad's not a woodsman. He'll cut it down. And he did. All I'm thinking, I'll cut it down and lay it over on the trailer. <laughs> Dad always said this, I can do anything I set my mind to do. Now, he's believed talking about with God with him. The first people before the Tower of Babel understood that principle. 
They started to build a tower, the Bible says, into the heavens where God had commanded them to disperse. And what, this is what God said of them. They said they're on one mind and one cord. They can do whatever they set their mind to, except he intervened. You know, that's what the confusion of languages began. All of a sudden, they couldn't understand one another. But it's this belief that comes from, and folks, that Satan, he just like for you to believe that you can't. That you can't be anything in the kingdom. You can't have faith through this trial. You can't be strong. If someone else is, let them be the strong one. Let someone else be the one out front. And I'm telling you, God is raising up Elisha and Joshua's to take places of Elijah and Moses. God's wanting something different. A church that's living has another generation that's coming along behind them saying, you did that. You trusted God. You believed God. Therefore, I can. I am so grateful I grew up in a church like that where they believed in the miraculous and God did the miraculous. Where the preacher's wife was diagnosed with cancer but God healed her. Where the preacher was discharged from the uh, army because he had grand mal seizures, epilepsy and God healed him that they would believe God to do the impossible. Started a church because God told them to. They just believed that God would be with them. God had spoken to his heart. He says, when you need something, I'll send it. When you need a carpenter, you'll have a, I'll send a carpenter. If you need a plumber, I'll send a plumber. And God did that through his ministry. Uh, they got to a place they wanted to build a Sunday school and a fellowship hall out behind it. And a guy that didn't even know Jesus came in and poured the concrete and laid the block. Isn't that amazing? And God doing exactly what he said. In that church, my dad, he's the one that, uh, uh, it was block walls when we was there. Dad, he paneled the whole thing. That's what God can do. Never a lot of people, but folks, they taught me that God can do things. And they raised me up. And when they seemed God began to move in my life, they gave me opportunity. Taught me what was right from wrong. Now the only thing that would stand in the way of this, sin will make us weak. If there's sin in the camp, as such in the case in the time of Joshua, there was sin in the camp, even Joshua couldn't win. So sin has to be dealt with. If we're not living our lives right toward God, if there's something wrong, then we can't expect God to be with us in the rest of our life. But whatever sin, the Bible says, lay aside the sin that so easily besets us. Sometimes the things that got a hold of us, we think it's just too big, we can't change. That's because we don't know God like we ought to know. God is able I believe in the power of encouragement. I believe in the abilities that God has given you guys to speak things that would help someone. I know that you know someone hurting because why? Pretty much if you're alive, at some place in your life you have pain. Bible says even in laughter there's sorrow. Most of us, if it's something's going on, if it's not right in front of our face at the moment, there's still something that we're having to deal with, sort of like the storm clouds on the horizon. But words can change a life. Encouragement can change a life. And God grant you the wisdom to see when someone needs it. Don't withhold good, the Bible says, from those that when it's your power to do it. I, get, I think the guy's name was John Trent, but he wrote a, uh, an illustration that I want to close with. He says, recently I heard a touching story which illustrates the power that words have to change a life, a power that lies right in the hands of those reading this article. Mary had grown up knowing that she was different from the other kids. She hated it. 
She was born with a cleft palate and had to bear the jokes and stares of cruel children who teased her nonstop about her misshaped lip, crooked nose, and garbled speech. With all the teasing, Mary grew up hating the fact that she was different. She was convinced that no one outside her family could ever love her until she entered Mrs. Leonard's class. Mrs. Leonard had a warm smile, a round face, and shiny brown hair. While everyone in her class liked her, Mary came to love Mrs. Leonard. In the 1950s, it was common for teachers to give their children an annual hearing test. However, in Mary's case, in addition to her cleft palate, she was barely able to hear out of one ear. Determined not to let the other children have another difference to point out, she would cheat on the test each year. The whisper test was given by having a child walk to the classroom door, turn sideways, close one ear with a finger, and then repeat something which the teacher whispered. Mary turned her bad ear toward her teacher and pretended to cover her good ear. She knew that teachers would often say things like, the sky is blue, or what color are your shoes? But not on that day. Surely God put seven words in Mrs. Leonard's mouth that changed Mary's life forever. When the whispered test came, Mary heard the words, the words, I wish you were my little girl. Some folks just need to know that they're loved. It just makes a difference. It's knowing at the moment when people are surrounded by the things that are going and what to say and what to do. A word spoken in due season, King James says. I remember a story about the civil rights movement when they first started to integrate the black and the white children. And this little black girl was on the way to school and they were surrounded by an angry white mob terrified and she went to the bus stop and she sat on the bench waiting for her bus to come for her to go to school all around her angry faces this little old white man walked up and sat down beside her put his arm around her don't have to know what to say don't she probably never knew his name But that testimony of that moment ministers to me this morning. You can have that impact in someone's life. My whole life has been spent around looking for what God is doing in someone's life and try to tell them I see God doing something. I see God doing something. I see God has put love in your heart. I see God has put wisdom in your heart. I've seen God has given you gifts and ability. You can do this. You can do this. Uh, We had youth camp here. And uh, there was a young lady that come. And she was a bit overweight and self-conscious. But she loved, uh, she loved to sing praises. And I remember I, I, I talked her into singing a special. And it, she reminded me so much at that moment of a, of a child. You ever, you ever say, get a child to focus on you, you can do it? You can do it? Come on. And as she sang, I noticed that she focused on me, and I, I, I don't know how you give a reassuring look, but I tried to give one. <laughs> I may have come out more looking like I was struggling with gas. I don't know. I guess with this bearded face, sometimes I might look mean. I don't know. But I noticed as she sung, she kept looking my way, kept looking my way. During that... I've, I saw God touch kids. I remember one young man, 
Uh, they come from it, and uh, he kind of wanted to bend the rules. I wouldn't let him. But before it was over, he, would, he expressed an interest in knowing who Jesus was. And after all this was over, this young lady, she sang a song. This is the song that she sang after youth camp. She had picked it out herself, sung it at our church when we got back. If I could get someone to advance that. Whatever you do for the cause of Christ, it's not forgotten. Whatever you do for these little ones will not be forgotten. It will bring you joy in such a way that you don't know. My name is Marcia Never. Thanks for being with us today. I hope you'll join us again next time, same place. Love and prayers from the High Encounters team.